My name is Greg Evangelatus. It's April 2nd, 2024. And we're in Redondo Beach, California. We're going to answer these questions from uh, Guide Dogs of the Desert. Okay, number one. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Are you currently working? What was your previous occupation? All right, well, um, I used to be president and founder of the National Disabled Foundation. And we put on um, a computer learning center at Cal State Dominguez Hills where we taught college uh, disabled students about uh, technology and we put on the uh, Alternative Visions Disability Awareness Art Show uh, annually and then the big program was our National Disabled Foundation Los Angeles Athletic Festival. So at Griffith Park once a year we put on this event where we'd have tandem cycling events so there'd be about 50 blind children uh, there ch children through teenagers and we get bikes from the Braille Institute and Foundation for the Junior Blind. They were very supportive of me and my program. Um, I would, the Foundation for the Junior Blind would bring a busload of their blind children every summer to the event and, the, and as well the Braille Institute would. And many uh, people from the community would show up. Uh, we'd get lots of tandem bikes as uh, a donation. We'd have professional mechanics there that would tune up all the bikes before the competition. A lot of professional racers would donate their time as guides. And we put on uh, the cycling event where uh, a huge tandem cycling event. There would be wheelchair races, also um, people that had balancing problems, and also some people that used wheelchairs, um, and, and also some people that used walkers, you know, would use hand bikes. We'd have a hand bike competition. And then also we had able body people on traditional uh, bikes, so we would, be it's you know socially mixing able-bodied and disabled people so they could learn to be with each other through the fun of sports um, we'd have beat baseball competition going on and at the festival we'd have gymnastics which uh, again able-bodied and people that were amputees and some blind people would participate in gymnastics we'd have up down tennis matches where a person in a wheelchair would team up with an able-bodied person and they would compete in uh, tennis matches and then we'd have a uh, go ball for the blind then we'd have uh, playground equipment and food and drink for everyone and so it was uh, the children could play on the playground equipment that we'd set up for the day and it was a great event for the whole family so that's what I did for uh, 20 years and then I went on to um, it closed down after 9-11 <clears throat> then I got more into real estate later on in life I attended real estate school and got into uh, bringing a group of investors into investing in uh, homes and um, I would uh, oversee them and and also be involved with the remodeling of those uh, programs so I you know we would um, do this in various cities uh, around the United States. Okay. Number two, what can you tell us about your vision? Describe residual vision, if any, the current prognosis, and talk about how your vision has affected your daily life. Okay, well, I'm totally blind. Uh, I have no retinas, so that pretty much answers that question. When I was blinded, um, before that, I was uh, a teenager in high school, a football player and, uh, and a surfer, and so very athletic. But when I went blind, of course, I needed training from the Braille Institute and the Foundation for the Junior Blind, which I lived there for three months while I went through my training. I learned about mobility uh, lessons, and, excuse me, and how to use a, a cane. They would take me to many street crossings, sometimes even five-way crossings, and they teach me to listen for the signals and study the traffic flow so I know when to cross. Um, I've done that traveling all over Los Angeles with a big, long, solid cane, you know, for years, but that's when I was 20 years old to 30 years old, and then every decade I seem to have slowed down and crossed a little bit less busy streets. Um, but I had to go through that independent training and learn to uh, take care of myself. I cook, 
I barbecue, I clean my house, I uh, live independently, um, and um, I do have someone that helps me read my mail and help with correspondence, but uh, I go on the internet and write letters and do administrative work all the time. Okay. Number three, tell us why you are applying for a guide dog and your reason for choosing guide dogs of the desert. Okay, um, I'm applying for a guide dog because um, my last guide dog was several years ago and I was so heartbroken the first few years, I didn't want another dog because I was sad. Um, and then I decided that I was maybe going to move to a single family home, single story with a backyard so the dog could run around in the backyard like my sister, she has that set up with the, uh, she has a dog door in her kitchen that leads out to her backyard. So her dogs just go out, relieve themselves whenever they want. And that makes life a whole lot easier where, um, that didn't happen because I'm still living in the condo. And, and um, so I was waiting and waiting and, uh, I, I finally decided now I want to have a dog because it's, it helps me to get around and it's much easier with the dog than with the cane. Um, I thought that it could expand my uh, routes around the neighborhood. Um, and I think as a 62 year old man, it would be much easier to go back to using a guide dog than depending on a cane all the time. Okay, uh, number four. Have you ever had a guide dog or attended a guide dog school? If so, please tell us about your experience and about the previous guides you have worked with. Yeah, I used to uh, go to, I was, when I was attending Rutgers University, I went to uh, the c &I in Morristown, New Jersey, and I received a German Shepherd, and Lipton was an incredible guide. I mean, even during rainstorms there, he would, uh, he was tough. He would go, if the water was even up to his chest, he would march me across the street and get me to get me home. And um, we had a great experience there. The dog was super intelligent, helped me go through college. And then um, years later, uh, when I was living in California, I applied to guide dogs for the blind in San Rafael, California. This time I received a beautiful female American lab. Her name was Fennel. And we traveled all over the world and uh, really, enjoyed a loving and great friendship and we had so much fun together really was sorry to hear i mean to have her uh pass on me you know that was heart heartbreaking but um uh i had great experience with all my dogs found them they taught me things that i couldn't even imagine they actually taught me more about mobility instead of trailing things with my cane all the time when I didn't have my dogs, I would learn to walk straight down the center of the sidewalk and the center of the pathways as the guide dog taught me. Really, it became, I became a better cane traveler after I experienced having guide dogs. Okay. Um, Did I answer that question? Yes. Completely, okay. Yes. Um, number five, have you ever returned a guide dog to the guide dog school? If so, what were the reasons? Yeah, unfortunately, my first dog, uh, Lipton, the German Shepherd, after he lived with me for about a year, year and a half, I think it was, he started to become too protective of me. So um, the guide dog trainers taught me how to, to explain to him that I didn't want him to growl at people, but he kept growling at anyone that would come near me. They said some light bulb went on the, in the German Shepherd's head, which does happen from time to time, and they decide that they're gonna protect me. Um, that was most unfortunate. Uh, I didn't wanna give up my dog because I fell in love with Lipton and we're, he was so loyal to me and you know we had such a bonded relationship. But I had kept communicating with other friends that I met at the uh, guide dog school uh, in uh, Morristown, New Jersey the C and I, and they told me, Greg, I had German Shepherds and I never wanted to give up my dog. I, I refused to do it. And, you know, seven years later, I gave up the dog. And um, even though it was growling at everybody, and when I finally got a new German Shepherd and that dog didn't growl, I realized 
this is what it's all about. And I realized I should have listened to the guide uh, dog school uh, trainers. And when they told me that the dog is being too protective, I should give up the dog. I should have listened to them and done that right away. And I suggest you do that. Well, I, I trusted my friend and the trainers were telling me the same thing. So I gave up Lipton about a year and a half later and sent them home to the guide dog school. Okay, uh, number six, have you had orientation and mobility training? Explain when and for how long. Did you see receive instruction in outdoor travel skills, intersections, traffic control, street crossing? Indicate the length of time you've been an independent and confident cane traveler. Right, so I've been a, you know, confident cane traveler for more than 40 years. So I've traveled everywhere around Greek villages where there are no streets. I've learned how to use my orientation skills to get to the boats, to go to the beaches, to the uh, bridge, to go over the, uh, over the bridge and down the other steps on the other side and go to my friend's house. I've, um, you know, um, I've learned, um, you know, I basically answered this question, I think, before, you know, going to the Braille Institute and Foundation for the Junior Blind, they taught me when I first became blind, mostly from 18 to 20, how to perfect my skills. Uh, I get more and more ambitious and more and more confident. And then after 20, I would travel all over the city. Um, and then time for time, you know, when I stopped getting cane traveling skills uh, lessons, I would uh, then maybe... 15 years later or so, uh, go back to El Camino College where I decided to get a real estate license or from time to time brush up on my computer skills. And I need to go learn to go all around that university to my classes, but I also take, uh, I also am an avid uh, lap swimmer. So I'd learn to go to the pool and to the workout gym. And I was all independent all around there. And then, um, and then uh, when I moved here to this condo, there's a Redondo Beach Pier, and I wanted to learn to go around all the restaurants and stores there. So I had uh, Miss Hayes uh, come teach me, and then from the Braille Institute. And then more recently, I uh, joined a membership to this uh, South Bay Aquatics um, uh, pool, and they have six swimming pools. But I had the manager teach me how to walk around there just like in an hour or so. And I figured it out where the bathrooms were, where the showers are. Things have become easier in my mind to figure out over the years as I became more confident. I almost feel like I can figure them out sometimes without even a sighted person explaining them to me. But I do like to have a sighted guidance the first time. Well, anyways, everything was going well, but there's a... a um, uh, a physical therapy swimming pool that this one company uses and their patients are always using their walkers and leaving their wheelchairs out and and, and um, their spouses for instance will leave the chairs out in the pathway and I was having to go around them and it was disorientating me because they'd always move them around so I called the Braille Institute they sent an orientation and mobility instructor there and within just a a one visit she goes Greg let's do this a different way let's go around all the pools and and um, it's a little bit longer of a pathway but I've learned it and that has really uh, improved the quality of my experience at the swimming pool I go there three days a week and swim laps so having a guide dog oh my gosh it'll just be easy peasy um, mm -hmm. how's that okay uh, number seven please describe your home environment House, mobile home, apartment, number of rooms, yard, length of occupancy. You're welcome to show us around and walk us through your home. All right. Well, while I answer that question, you want to follow me, Sally? Okay. So this is my kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, I've lived here 24 years. It's a condominium. Um, uh, what was the what was, was the condominium? What was the all those questions? Let's see. Basically, um, it's. Uh, right on the sand here in Redondo Beach. I'm going to open this and take you out to my balcony. And I have a little shade here I put down which blocks the hot sun from coming in. And, and it makes the glare from people's eyes. Uh, it's like wearing sunglasses in a way. Plus it keeps the bugs and the dust out. It's really nice. But the beach is right there. The boardwalk is right there where we walk on all the time. 
And then I have a barbecue right here, which I cook on over there on the right. Um, and then uh, I walk to well, my fireplace. Um, and then I um, I remodeled all this too. I have a lot of uh, creativity. And then I go up here uh, to my bedroom, and I go up here now. Then I'll. Uh, she used to always run up these stairs in the morning and uh, give me the nose and tell me it's breakfast time. Come on. And uh, so I would uh, uh, walk down with her. But I used to put a bed up here too so she could sit up here. And I'd sleep here and then I'd, um, here's my jacuzzi. Um, where is this? No, this is the massage bed. So this is a jacuzzi right over here and I use that. And then, let's see, I walk back here, I have my exercise bike over here on the right, and then I'll just let you know there's another restroom right back here. So I don't think you guys need to know more than that. Okay. Um, now, are we going to let it continue to go? I think so till we get back down. Okay, then you can ask me the next question. Yeah. I'm going to shut the sliding glass door so the noise Okay. Doesn't. Shut it off or not? No, I didn't. Okay, what's the next question? Okay, so the next question is, where do you intend to relieve your dog? Well, the same place where I relieved Phil for many years. Um, she lived, I think she was with me 11 years, and then the guide dog school finally said, Greg, I know it's heartbreaking, but it's time for you to find a family to take care of your dog for so it can retire. So I did. My best friends actually took care of that dog but to answer your question right at the bottom of uh well i mean right outside the lobby door there is a grass area right in front of the home there and the people who have lived there have never minded uh dogs relieving on their grass but i always pick up and then there's a trash can right down the street on the sidewalk and uh Phil would always walk me right down there i just tell her trash can trash can and she'd take me right down there and I'd throw the baggie in the uh, trash can and then come back and uh, we'd go for a walk and always carry hand sanitizer with me. So that's where I relieve them, right, at the, right by the lobby of the building. Are there any other pets in the home? No pets in the home. Who else lives in the home? No one else lives here but me. Describe the types of areas where your dog will be working. Residential, small or large business districts, mall or rural travel. All right, well, you know, residentially, we walk to the pier a lot to go down there for meals. That's about a mile and a half from my house. I go down regularly to the little mini market on the corner and they have a grill in there where I get some uh, tacos and sandwiches and, and uh and it's a mini mark, so I can get beverages there too. And then uh, sometimes I walk to other places in this neighborhood, but I don't walk all the way to the mall because that's like maybe 15 miles away, 10, 15 miles away. I've never walked to the malls. Um, I will walk to the dentist, which is down on Del Mar, and that's about two miles, I think, from my house, three miles. Um, then... Um, I travel to Las Vegas area, uh, Summerlin and um, different areas around there to look at properties. So the dog would travel with me there. Um, also to uh, around Los Angeles and also Hawaii. I look at properties in Hawaii quite often. So we go there and um, I don't think that's ever a problem. The only thing is the dog would need to be comfortable flying because we do fly a lot in, in that situation. So usually they're short flights back and forth from Las Vegas, five hour flights back and forth from Hawaii. But then for vacation, I'm Greek American and we'll go uh, uh, four to six weeks every summer to Greece. And I have islands there that I love. And the locals have already showed me over the years with fennel where they want me to take my dog to relieve. And so I'm not really interested in exploring other islands anymore. I know the couple of islands that I really enjoy and I'm comfortable and I have friends there. 
and I'd be taking my new dog uh, to those islands where I have already determined the relieving areas and I know that they uh, welcome my guide dogs. And, um, but the point is, is they have to know, be able to travel usually on, let's say a long flight and then a short flight to get to Greece. So it's a 10 hour flight to get to Europe. And then it's usually, let's say a three or four hour flight from the country that I land in to get to Greece. Um, and so I'm experienced with walking the dog the night before and giving them uh, just a little food and then getting them to relieve. And then in the morning to getting them to relieve again and cutting their food so that they can uh, travel without being very uncomfortable and giving them a little a little a bit of kibble along the way to settle their stomach. Um, and so I do need a dog, hopefully that will have experienced international travel, but that's a lot to request. So if, if so, so if not, I'll teach them. Okay. Um, do you volunteer or work at a location outside of the home? Please describe your work or volunteer environment. What is their attitude towards having a guide dog? Well, I've already answered this as far as like when I travel to Las Vegas or travel to Hawaii, it's usually realtors that are taking us around. And their attitude is pretty much, um, you know, they might ask, is the dog going to poop in the house? And I'll tell them, no, they're trained for that. And most realtors are really happy to see the dog. I, I usually have to tell them not to pet the dog because uh, the dog is working. And if you want, after we get done uh, inspecting the property, I can take the harness off and then they can say hello. Oh, but that's it's nice. never been a problem. Okay, what is your plan for accommodating the needs of your guard dog, guide dog while at work? Um, usually, the, the accommodations are usually hotels when we travel because we're there for maybe a week to three weeks and we're inspecting different properties. But we usually stay in a hotel so they have a good life, uh, air-conditioned, and I feed them there. Like I said, I'm very experienced at traveling, so I'm used to having a backpack with all my dog's medicines and food and water uh pans and um let's see um and i always you know bring a little rolled up mat so they have their their place they know that they I put it down anywhere i go and they know that's their place to go sit in relation to the 28 day on campus training and factoring in qualities for a compatible handler guide dog team is there any health information that you think we should know about? Um, no, I, uh, the fir both, because I only had Lipton for a year and a half, after I finished the 30-day program at the CNI, um, the guide dogs uh, in, in, in San Rafael, California, they also wanted me to stay for 30 days. Um, so I've done that twice, and there's no health problems or limitations. Okay. Number 15, do you have a canine allergy or anyone in your immediate family have this allergy? Um, I have allergies. I've had them since I was a kid. So I have, um, I take a uh, singular for my lungs every day and use Advil inhaler. And every day I take um, a uh, Allegra for my sinuses and I use nasal cord. Now, I used to get like a, a bronchial infection every winter. And so my doctor said, Greg, you can't take antibiotics every winter. We don't want that. So we're gonna start you on a like a therapy treatment where every day you're gonna take these allergy medicines and that will prevent you from getting run down in the winter time and catching this, uh, catching, you know, getting an infection. And also in the summer when everything's blowing around, you won't get uh, run down either. And so we just rather you be on this on a daily treatment for the rest of your life uh, year round. So I've been doing that. And since then I don't have as much allergy problems and I don't get antibiotic. I don't need antibiotics in the winter. However, you know, we've also thought about maybe it's because I was always in 24 hour fitness during the winter time. And of course we've all learned about viruses now where people would be sneezing and touching the elevator buttons and the uh, stair masters and the treadmills and the bicycles, which I used to use in the gym and lifting weights. And so maybe I was catching it during the winter time that way. But um, 
I don't go into those gyms anymore because I don't want to stay away from viruses. Um, but the point is, is that since I do have allergies, um, when I had both Lipton, the German Shepherd, and Fennel, the Labrador, when I'd have to groom them all the time, I mean, I love those dogs, but I'd always have to have a tissue box in me because I'd always be sneezing. And um, it just, uh, you know, twice a year when they have that burst thing where they get rid of their winter coat and then six months later get rid of their summer coat, I'd be sneezing like crazy. Um, and so uh, that was a problem. So the poodle... Um... So, well, I wanted uh, the poodle. So, well, the reason why I, I was explaining to Sally, when I called um, the uh, Guide Dogs for the Blind in San Rafael and asked them about a poodle, they said, no, Greg, but we recommend Guide Dogs in the Desert. They specialize in poodles, and that would probably be better for you. Um, I also, as a 62-year-old guy, I'm still pretty good shape, but... It's harder for me to get up and down on the ground and groom the dog every day. It's harder. Um, I can get down and back up. As I say, I go into the pool and swim laps every day and jump back out of the pool. But um, the thing is, is that um, I only have to pick the dog about 45 minutes every day. So that way in the morning, if I have to go to the doctor's office, I can take care of myself, shower, feed my dog, relieve, and jump in the car and go. Where, um, you know, with Fennel, I used to have to take her outside, let her do her business, then groom her outside because hair would go everywhere. And um, then clean her up, wipe her down, clean my hands, then come back up and take a shower, get dressed, and then go. So, to me, grooming or, or picking a, a poodle... And being able to do it throughout the day when it's convenient for me and not having to do it every time we jump in a car um, in the first thing in the morning because of the hair problem, it seems like it's going to make my life much easier. And I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, other than understanding basic guide work, please describe the three most important traits you feel you need in your guide dog when it's working and explain your reasons. Assertive, focused, alert, calm, etc. Um, well, I do like a calm dog, that's for sure. But um, as opposed to like Lipton, the German Shepherd, they said if I don't walk it 10 miles a day, it had so much energy that, uh, well, it would run around and it would bark right through the window at anyone it could fine you know it was it was have kind of a lot of energy so fennel was calmer and she, whenever we go someplace it, it, if i would want to sit back and like for instance talk on the phone she just curl up next to me and put her head on my uh on my uh leg usually my foot and go to sleep and i appreciate that um also i need a dog that focuses of course like when i went walking with keith the district manager of guide dogs for the blind the first time he came here, six weeks after we graduated, to do a check of the dog and me to see how it was going, we were about three blocks away, across the street from my house, down the street. And we were walking back towards my house, and she, he goes, he goes, Greg, I just want to tell you something. Fennel is already staring at the front lobby of your building. That dog is intuitive, and she's so focused. She knows where your destination is. So it would not be nice that a dog focuses like that um, and is, of course, very aware when we're crossing the street to be able to uh, 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 alert me if a dog, I mean, if, for instance, if a car is uh, crossing the street uh, 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 against the red, for instance, uh, Fennel and, and Lipton were both trained to yank back so that to get me out of the street. Um, and also, I like a dog, you know, both these dogs, they learn through association. So if I go into a bathroom and I'd take them to a urinal and say, urinal, urinal, and I'd sit them down and pet them. After a while, they learn the word urinal. And they, as a matter of fact, intuitively learn the, the routine. They'll take me to the urinal, then take me right to the sink so I can wash my hands, take me over to the paper towel so I can... <laughs> it was amazing how they... And if the trash can wasn't right there, they'd turn around and look for it and take me there. But, um, you know, first you have to work with the dog through association and say, 
let's find the paper towels, you know, for my hands. And they look around or let's find the trash can and they look around. And so um, it's nice that a dog can learn those things. Also, of course, we want to make sure they make the right decision uh, as far as distractions. They're not distracted by cats or other dogs running around when we're getting ready to cross the street. And if I ask them to take me, you know, to the corner, they don't stop 10 feet ahead just to test me. We want them to be able to make the right decision and not do what they want to do. Um, as we know, some dogs challenge us, but it takes sometimes about a year for them to bond with us and fall in love and do what we really want them to do. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, okay, number 17. When your guide dog is not working, what personality traits would you like to see in your guide dog? And explain why. Affectionate, attentive, playful, friendly. Um, of course, I'd love a friendly dog, one that likes people. Um, I like a playful dog. I think that because I played with Fennel all the time, she be fell in love with me that way. Like she realized I was her favorite play partner. We would, I'd get on my knees and run, crawl around the couch and she'd chase me. Then I'd turn around and chase her and we just made a game out of it. Uh, we'd play with her toys, and she just loved uh, my playful fun that we'd have together. It definitely m nurtured the bonding process. And, um, you know, a lot of times when I'd want her to learn a new area, let's say I wanted her to learn a new restaurant, we'd go that direction, and then, and then I, I, I would tell her, you know, I'd give her a signal to go to the right, even though she'd be looking to the left thinking, hey, we always go to the left. I'd get her to go to the right and we'd go find a new restaurant that I wanted to check out. And we'd get there and I'd sit her down at the doorstop and I'd give her some kibble. And she would love that. And the next time I came there, if we got to that corner and I told her to go to the right, she would go straight there and she'd be <laughs> waiting for her kibble. Sometimes she got kibble or sometimes she just got a lot of love. And, but she was good with that. Okay, so here's the last question. Are you willing to accept the guide dog that the experienced professionals at Guide Dogs of the Desert Training Department select as the most compatible for you? Oh, yeah. You know, in the end, I know the dogs, I mean, the instructors, they know what's best for me. For instance, when I came to uh, Guide Dogs for the Blind, I wanted a male. I wanted a male, one that was going to be strong and fast and um they came to me and said greg okay we found this female named fennel and we think this fennel this female will be great match for you and at first i was like a female oh my god she's not gonna be as fast and strong and oh well she taught me wrong <laughs> that dog fennel was so strong she could pull me down the beach if she wanted to you know and she was just the greatest and so yeah of course i'm gonna choose the dog and be happy with the dog that uh, guide dogs of the desert uh, choose for me. Okay, great. That's the end of our interview. So our next part is just our walk.